So um, hello, I'm Jenny McKellar, one of the curators of craft and design at Manchester Art Gallery. And today I'd like to share with you a conversation with Forest and Found, which are the artists Max Bainbridge and Abigail Booth. <clears throat> hello. Hello. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Forest and Found are one of the six artists who are currently exhibiting at Manchester Art Gallery as part of the Jerwood Makers Open. Um, the gallery is current, currently closed, but I thought I'd share some images with you of um, the gallery space. Okay, so the images you should be able to see here, um, the show's over two spaces. This is Gallery 2, which we have Mark Corfield Moore and Lucy Gladhill. Um, and you can see more of their work here. We've also got Beth and Lloyd Worthington. You can see her work there. And then when we go up to Gallery 11, and um, we can see Tana West and then Tana West again and then you can see here um, Forest and Found's um, work here. So oh, and, for, uh, there, um, and then Max and Abby um, when they came to the preview for the show. So I thought um, Max and Abby could maybe introduce their work a bit and talk about um, the pieces. So um, our installation for the Joe of Makers Open, its overarching title is the subjective element. Um, and when we proposed the idea in our initial proposal to the Jerwood, um, it was very much about taking the idea of the tree sourcing materials from landscape, natural materials directly from landscape, um, and taking that as the starting point for looking at our psychological and physical relationship to site and place through um, specifically wood, but sort of broader than that. Um, so it was the first time really um, that we had produced a body of work from start to finish, thinking about it going on display as a kind of a single body of work that we both produced. Um, so but, yeah, so if I jump in and sort of explain that the canvases on the wall um, are made by myself and Max is, sculpt, is the sculptor and produces the vessels. Um, and so we, we are in our practices sort of operate quite independently, but we also collaborate together. So this was the first time and we've made an installation as a whole from the starting point um, together, meant meaning to go on display. Um, yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, so, Hannah, we have a few questions to ask you. Um, and the first one really is, how, how are you doing during lockdown? Um, yeah, pretty good overall, really. Um, I mean, that picture you just put up of us at the show, oh, uh, my, yeah. hair, my, my hair is definitely a lot shorter now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Ab Abigail's been perfecting. Yeah, uh, perfecting the cut. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're, we're really lucky because our studio is in our back garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which at times sometimes feels inhibiting on a regular day-to-day -day basis prior to lockdown but now we're in lockdown that's actually a complete blessing um so Can that show, um photographs of your um yes of course. those up now so let's have a look so yeah can you see those images there yeah so um yeah so that's kind of that's we, our studio is sort of in two separate um well, it's one space, but it's divided because we both have quite different work. So I work with cloth and Max works predominantly with wood. So that sense of needing that separation to divide the material nature of it. Um, but the door is always open. So we are, you know, it's a very small space. So we are always sort of talking. But, but yeah, that that element of how it's that's very, these images are quite true to life in the sense of when we're working, it is that sense of constant mess it's organized mess yeah isn't organized it? chaos really it's kind of there's it's such a small space and we've i mean i've got far more just stuff than you and you're a lot of machines quite and... a lot of machinery and tools and things that have to go somewhere but we've kind of organized it so things can go away to maximize the space um when they're not needed but it's always there's always kind of something going on and i think that sense of when it's that active when we're sort of developing new work or experimenting and that sense of stuff being out and present and being able to respond to each other's processes is really important because then there's constant dialogue between the materials we're working with or different processes that feed into each other's work. I was looking at one of the images um, last night and I think it's, um, so yes, it's yours, Abby, where you've got these small pictures. Um, mm -hmm. that, is it a portrait? Do you want to talk a bit more about those or 
so yeah so there like we when again now we're in lockdown we can't really do that but we do go and see a lot of exhibitions um mm -hmm. all over the country really we have family in the southwest so it's not just london based mm -hmm. um, and we make a real effort to do that as much as we can even though mm -hmm. our schedule can get really busy um and so the those images tend to just come from shows we've seen paintings we've seen bits of sculpture um and also it, they're also not just sort of artworks it might be things we've snapped on the phone mm -hmm. um, and anything and i just tend to part of my process is when i've amassed a few ideas of or things that i'm looking at that i'm interested in mm -hmm. i just print a few off and just pin them straight up on the wall and then they go up with also the material experiments so different pigments on cloth different mm -hmm. sort of things that are ongoing and that just helps feed in to that you know to that process and I, it's, it's funny i think you often you look back at a body of work and you re and then you look walk back into your studio once that body of work's left the studio and you suddenly see with a bit of sort of with a bit of distance you suddenly see actually what's fed into those works mm. whereas yeah. at the time it's so subconscious that you you're not you don't really realize um yeah so the um so these um, images here, do they relate to the um, two large finished works that you, the images you sent that were in your living room, I think, that were then sent out? Um, no, they've, they've, been up, they've been up a lot longer, actually. Uh, okay. One is, I think, the Madonna and Child from the, the Michelangelo exhibit at the Royal Academy, the drawing yeah. um, with Bill Viola. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is a painting, and I don't know, I think, I can't remember if that was in uh, in an exhibition of a huge group show of works in ha at House and Worth in Somerset. I can't mm. remember now. That's really um, strong. Oh, was, it all theme, was it all female yeah, artists? Yeah, and I, that, feel, I yeah. feel like that's maybe where that came from. Mm. Um, but that sense of, I'm, I'm just interested in the way that paint is used and the way that paint is figurative and representation of paint, representation of paint, is paint and use paint sort of on the body, on clothing, on cloth. Um, and and then that feeds into my work in a far more sort of abstracted way mm -hmm. so i think that t tends to be the commonality um mm -hmm. uh when if i'm if i'm thinking about those reference images what mm -hmm. i'm looking at so it's that uh, it's the actual application of paint mm -hmm. and the technique that i'm sort of looking at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i think i saw another image where i don't know if it's if i've got it here where there's a Francis Bacon, was there a Bridget Riley as well? Um, yes. Yeah. 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 So it's great to see those um, different types of kind of, I guess, artists together in your studio and then the work that you produce. Um, yeah, because I think, yeah, we and we both look and are interested in a lot of this big crossover in the artists we're looking at. Yeah. Um, but find, we find that image. Um, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt All you. Right. Let's see where that image has gone. Um, Let's have a look. Um, oh, I don't know whether I can bring that up. Um, bear with me one second. Here it is. There it is, I think. Yeah, it was here. Yeah. So, and oh, is it, yeah. uh, who is it, the one at the top as well? So, that there's a Rachel White read at the top. Oh. That's one of her mattresses in cast. I think that's resin. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and Francis Bacon below, um, mm. which is a dog, which that's been up there forever because that's. Mm such a haunting image mm. uh, and then the Bridget that's just from the catalogue of the Bridget Riley show the little mm. leaflet from the one that was on recently at the Haywood and then is that mm -hmm. that's Yard Kettle's below. Yard below mm -hmm. uh, and then the one below that is just is actually a quilt and uh, <laughs> an antique quilt so there's a real range of references going on uh, yeah in terms and some of these images I've had for years and years and some are more changeable Mm -hmm. um, or come and go quite quickly. It's quite, it's quite nice when Abigail's kind of like when she changes them up. I come, offer them to she you. She comes into my my bit of the studio and just says, "I've got these. Do you want them?" <laughs> and then every now and again, I'll take something that kind of. It yeah. depends if there's space on yeah. my, on my yeah. wall. You yeah. keep you, you keep objects more. I think. Yeah, you I, both I, keep objects, yeah. but you have a lot more found objects. Yeah, things that I basically yeah. just drill holes in and screw, and screw them to the wall. Yeah, yeah. objects found in a forest, Max. All over, really. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of it is actually um, things from, tends to be things from walks, um, mm -hmm. and so that can be within within the kind of within a forest, just within like 
open countryside. A lot of it's coming from like beaches, mm -hmm. uh, like really beautiful bits of um, kind, kind, I, I guess they are driftwood, but they're sort of more where whole sections of tree have just fallen in and mm -hmm. then wa washed back up. So they're kind of quite gnarly mm -hmm. um, bits that, yeah, we've kind of, you know, I've got a really beautiful bit of um, Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. with, um, was from a, when we we went to Wales last year, and we went. Let's bring um, an image of your work up. Sorry, um, for interrupting. Right. If you keep on talking, I'll I'll bring it up for you. Um, um, yeah, we went for a, a really long walk, and we came across a kind of old section of forest that had been um, sort of logged, and mm -hmm. there was a big section of Douglas fir that had been um, broken off, and it was just like the outside of like like a, it was like dragon. Dragon hide. It was really beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, quite big. So those kind of like they're the sort of things that I tend to try and shove in my rucksack and then yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of struggle back with. But yeah. but yeah, but it's quite nice having that sort of like interplay between our spaces and practice and what you're what Abigail's interested in. Yeah, yeah. Obviously so much of it is similar to, and we go to see the shows together and mm -hmm. um and so that kind of sense of those bits coming back into my environment and sort of starting to think about, you know, how they, they, they kind of, they do start to have an effect and they kind of resonate sometimes, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, it tends to be her art, art off casts. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say um, your studio, um, you're very fortunate because you can access your studio during lockdown because it's at the back of your garden. Um, yeah. It's great. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask was um, your work in the Jerwood Makers Open focuses on wood as your kind of um, primary source material. Um, yeah. Has lockdown made you more resourceful in your practice? Um, it's certainly made you kind of, so I, I always, I kind of, I try and be as kind of sensible about the materials we get in terms of when I'm making a big vessel, there's always quite a lot of sizable offcuts mm -hmm. um, I tend to be working with whole sort of sections of trunk and so to kind of get them into a kind of into the kind of shape I need them to be to get on the put them on the lathe there's always quite big offcuts so that tends to be that I then spend time processing up those bits and um, cutting them into kind of more regular shapes and whether it's bowl blanks or just like billets of wood that I can then stack and drop mm -hmm. so I've always kind of approached the material like that but mm -hmm it's made me rediscover things that I'd kind of forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So we extended the studio maybe four or five years ago mm -hmm. and had to take out a plum tree and a damson tree. And we kept a lot of that wood and stacked it and had, uh, and just kind of, and I'd forgotten about it. And it was in a, it was a part outside of the studio that kind of, you don't really sort of go to that much. Mm -hmm. um, but then I sort of, rediscovered it and processed it up and it's been quite fantastic to work with that on mm -hmm. a much smaller scale mm -hmm. um, yeah because we're the same in as much as when i'm produced when i am all the canvases are made from cloth and cotton and mm -hmm. a lot of that i um also from the get-go seek out scraps um and off cuts um mm -hmm. to work with um so already prior to this whole lockdown and to the pandemic uh -huh. the, you know the, the scraps and those elements of the discarded cloth and constantly looking for sources of those are, are already prevalent and all the offcuts of one piece of work end up going into the next and uh -huh. um, uh -huh. so there was always this constant sense of it feed one feeding into another uh -huh. but i don't think that level of the value of of so this is like my scrap scrap pile yeah. <laughs> like varying oh. degrees and then and this has become far more important because every even though at the time it was like oh is it silly to say something that small and actually mm. now it's like no that's it's been brilliant because you've got this resource already there mm -hmm. and and it and they're all slightly different grades of cotton so they're mm -hmm. all slightly different off whites or whites and some have the marks of uh, drawn marks from other people mm. um, and then I've just rediscovered sort of all, I'm using a lot up of the kind of experiments and test pieces I've done over the time that I then keep or pin up then mm -hmm. I'm starting to come the prevalent sources of pigment or color in the work mm -hmm. so it's, yeah you're kind of it's it's always been there that level of resourcefulness mm. in those <laughs> our practices but it's you're, it's focusing in it's more of a zoomed in 
look at what we've got now. And do you find that you're allowing yourself more time in your processes as well? Shall I share some images of um, the dyeing that you've done? Yeah. Uh, look at those. Um, let's try and find some. So, yeah. Um, I think that. Here we go. So yeah, um, do you find you because of lockdown, you're allowed to take more time over and experiment more? Yes, because normally I think we've got into that pattern of you you get a deadline of a big exhibition or something, in, and actually that time to develop the work is sped right up, and that level of pressure, which is always good in some way, because some you need that pressure to you know get get your fire going um but just yeah for process like because when you're working with natural pigments so both sort of pigments for sort of paint that I'm making from scratch but also dyes yeah time element of it is the stronger the cut like the longer you can leave a piece of fabric in a dye vat the strength the stronger the dye um the pigment I'm using so in the works in the Jerwood, one of those is done with a linseed oil, linseed oil and beeswax, and that medium takes a very long time to cure. So mm -hmm. I'm battling against that. If I've got a deadline and I need something to cure, if I'm mm -hmm. rushing it, there's this element of panic. <laughs> yeah, under the you know underlying the whole process because you're willing something to dry and cure mm -hmm. in time. Um, and yeah, and so that that sense that actually you can just let things mellow take the time and see and that produces new effects and results because mm -hmm. you're not normally allowed several days or several nights to soak say like this image fabric in a tannin a wood this comes from the color comes from a mulberry tree so mm -hmm. those wood tannins the longer you leave it in the stronger that pigment um mm -hmm. yeah gets mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah so that's just such a luxury mm. yeah but because sorry max after you no, I was going to say, I think it's kind of, for, for me, I always have, I think for Abigail it's slightly different in terms of her ideas can be kind of like stewing for a, years, years <laughs> months and years. And, um, and I kind of, I have things and ideas and things that I want to kind of do all the time. Mm -hmm. and I find it difficult to just not be doing um, you're, you know. Yeah, you're the debate. So for Max, that sense of idea to working on that piece is almost instantaneous. I can't. It's like I, I because I, the wood is there, and you're taking away, mm -hmm. you know, you're taking away that material to reveal form or a or a piece or a vessel or mm -hmm. a sculpture. Whereas for me, you're building up. You're adding into it. Yeah, you're adding the, into it, and so that level of commitment, or that there's always intuitiveness and and sort of spontaneity within the actual piecing of work. But the development of pigment from scratch takes a long, long time. Mm. Um, so. And I suppose get sort of for me getting from having an idea to then implementing it, it can be literally seconds or minutes, mm. um, and that kind of then can be working on something quite small or just cutting something up on the bandsaw to kind of roughly piece together or something that it's an idea and then I need to work on it and need to try that out straight away mm -hmm. and that's that's always part of my process but when we have a big project on or I'm working on something that's dead you know I have to dedicate a lot of time to you almost start to feel kind of guilty about trying to work like that like you're you know I can have an idea start it and then it's like well actually my focus needs to be on this because this is a project we need to get done and what's mm -hmm. nice about the, about the kind of sort of situation we find ourselves in now is that I'm having the time to just let myself run with projects and run with ideas and it is opening up a lot more kind of areas of things that I've always had an inkling about wanting to explore mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but I've never had mm. enough time to dedicate to really pushing it and really even just figuring out whether it's possible um, yeah which I have done over the last kind of couple of months. So that's been really exciting. And that in sort of that entail then leads on to actually the possibilities of scaling that up and working on things that I've, you know, thought about, but again, never had the time to just play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. been, that's, that's a really positive thing that's come out of it. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. So one of the questions we were going to, well, the question we we're going to end on was asking you, um, what new skills have you learned during um, isolation? 
I think hairdressing is like in yeah. terms of a practical <laughs> skill that I would never ever ever have done or tried. Yeah. <laughs> Cutting Max's hair, there's been again that was only, a revelation that it was even possible. That was one out of necessity, and two, it was just like, well, we're not going anywhere. Nobody's yeah. really going to yeah. see me. So if it goes terribly, then, then it's it fine. doesn't really matter because it will just grow back. But there's something. Yeah. It's again, it kind of has that because that fear of getting it wrong and then yeah. once you're just approaching it as if it was a bit of work <laughs> and as much as it was like essentially this is kind of feels like sculpting yeah that's what you've got to do you've got to you know and I think that that sense of, yeah just stepping back and going okay don't treat it like this is Max's head yeah <laughs> and his hair great um treat it as if this is a bit of sculpture that you know what you want it roughly to look like and then yeah. go for it yeah it yeah, I think you've learnt a fantastic skill there, Abby. Thanks. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, we we kind of we relance. We've sort of all, in the midst of it all as well. We kind of relandscaped the garden, and we. I think the kind of the art of of, of laying new turf is. <laughs> I watched a lot of videos on how to do it. And right, you, you need to share that, yeah, because I need to lay, lay, lay some more turf. So yeah, please share. Yeah, no, yeah. it's. I mean, it's. It's. Um, I mean, well, the tip was to sow seed underneath. If you get grass seed, sow it underneath before you lay it, so that it can come through and. So that starts to, to grow to through, and it kind of helps it bed in, which did really work. Um, yeah. All about your ground preparation is what I've kind of. <laughs> Lots of, lo yeah. lot, lots of raking. I'm, I, it, but again, like having the time to, I made like a big, um, like tamper, like I turned like a big handle and like glued yeah. and screwed it to a really heavy bit of oak. And it's kind of like, I wouldn't have done that before because it would have just felt like I'm wasting time, I'm wasting material, you know. But yeah. that, that, so that was, that was great. And now yeah. we've got a really <laughs> dead flat. Yeah. sort of like it's bowling just, green lawn it's i think really it's good. an all-round resourcefulness that sense i think everyone has yeah. had to be far more resourceful yeah yeah when it first went into lockdown there's that real sense of oh you can't you can't access anything um yeah. even trying to order things online there's no way in hell you know that's yeah. gonna come um so i just think that sense of really looking at what you have and just using that and um even down to food you know cooking and i think that's just a really that's the nicest thing to take away from it in terms of mm -hmm. being more careful with how you use things and um yeah and just being mindful of what you know of how much you're using in the first place mm. i think I, I did something I, th I think you'll be proud of we um we're repotting some plants and I know I had some someone had cut a tree down at the back of our house and there were some branches and twigs and I've started to use those normally I'd buy bamboo to put my sweet peas mm. or whatever I'm now using those pieces yeah. of wood and they're more flexible than bamboo so I can shape yeah them. yeah, yeah. 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 and I just think that's the lovely thing about it it forces yeah. you to reassess the value of what you actually have yeah and, and you're, more in, yeah. you're more you're more yes you yeah you it's like you're you're engaging your brain more <laughs> and i think that's kind of been like that's been the over, that's like been the overall kind of feel from everything from like sort of tv programs we've been watching and on the news and everything and talking to friends and family and stuff that everybody seems to be focusing in on their kind of immediate environment and what's around them what's important yeah. to them um, yeah. you know yeah. what they actually kind of what they deem to be things that kind of give them pleasure and give them joy and what they've sort of turned to and I think it has made you know I think it's made a lot of people look at things that they've never done before like the Grayson Perry art club yeah yeah uh, seen has, has been fantastic to watch and kind of just so many people who have turned to painting and drawing and sculpting and just giving stuff a go that they've never done before mm, and finding, yeah, finding pure pleasure mm, from mm, it I just think is incredible and then again watching um like watching Gogglebox watch that program mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like the kind of the disbelief like why would anybody be interested in art and why would <laughs> anybody turn to that and then by the end of it you just think you've got all these people sitting there going wow that's amazing I want to have a go yeah go and get the note you know go and get the the your sketchbook or some paper to go and mm -hmm. to draw yeah. one another so it has I think it, it has made a lot of people kind of it's weird even though we've got restrictions it's somehow liberating to have restrictions it's kind of giving people freedom or permission to do things they wouldn't necessarily normally have done um, Absolutely, I think. Yeah. yeah i think that level of that's normally 
what you'd feel guilty about doing or taking exactly. time to do, that sense of guilt mm-hmm. is gone. Um, mm-hmm. And that the fact that not everyone is as lucky as you are and you're in the situation that you've got a safe home and you've got, you mm-hmm. know, I think that's made people actually sort of appreciate more what you mm-hmm. have and not take it for granted. Definitely. Not everyone ha- is, you know, has access to those kind of things or... And I think a lot of the yeah, and a lot of think a lot of priorities change that, and a lot of things that you don't think about before, and uh, you know a lot of the stuff to do with the NHS and and the kind of job they're doing, and what what the realities and the day to days of it are. I think people will have had no idea before, and Mm -hmm. now this has kind of brought all of those kind of things into the spotlight, and has Mm -hmm. you know has changed opinions and kind of actually cast light on what you know what what's important and how to support things like that yeah most definitely and do you want to talk a little bit about the work you've been doing is it with other artists where you've been um raising funds for the nhs yeah so we work with um a gallery called sarah myers coffee gallery um and they've been doing um, a project called objects to mark time Mm -hmm. where they're getting the gallery artists to produce um sort of smaller scale um pieces of work in response to kind of lockdown and the the sort of what how what what we're kind of operating through um Mm -hmm. and then they're auctioned off and then a percentage of that goes to um a charity that supports the nhs Mm -hmm. um and again that's been really nice to kind of to sort of look at one having a kind of um there's like a price a price cap um so that they're kind of more affordable works um for for the auction um and then that kind of makes you sort of and and on a sort of smaller scale and so that makes you then kind of again look to your immediate surroundings and the Mm -hmm. kind of materials we've got um and it was quite nice looking through what we had and thinking right this should work Mm -hmm. how do i how do i match so i made two vessels and two kind of plinths for them to sit on and that was all from one relatively smallish sweet chestnut log and that was kind of like how do i maximize this material mm-hmm. to get everything i possibly can out of it what mm-hmm. kind of things do i do to it how do i kind of manipulate it to become something interesting mm-hmm. and slightly different and push and have a relevance to mm-hmm. what you know what the project's about how it's kind of you know the sense of the domestic and all of those kind of things how do you kind of get the best out of um the material the limited mm-hmm. material that we're going to be working with so that's been that was really fun yeah um, fantastic to do that oh right well i'd like to say thank you very much for chatting with us um and i hope you stay safe in the lockdown um and yeah thank you very much for sharing your studio with us and your practices um it's awesome. been really enlightening thank you very much for having us yeah thank you, <laughs> thank you very much thank you.